Years ago, <clears throat> for those my age, well, you don't even have to be quite my age, to remember that there was a time before the internet in which we inquired music of different ways. Those ways were things such as vinyl records, 8-track tapes, cassette tapes, and also there was the old radio. And maybe some of you, I know that none of you predate radio, I don't think. Maybe close. But that's the way we gained our music. And for many of us, maybe people, just an average person like myself, we were limited how many vinyl records that we had. My sister had a small collection, my parents had a small collection, and we would hear those records being played over and over and over and over again. And I think my parents, especially on Sunday morning, there was a couple of albums, 33 albums, uh, 33 LPs that they loved to play every Sunday morning, and Dad liked to turn it up, and, <clears throat> and I won't tell you what, what kind of music it was. It was, it was uh, gospel-related music. <clears throat> But anyway, it was the same old songs, same old songs, and you just get tired of hearing the same old songs, don't you? Just over and over and over again. You don't know how fortunate you, you younger people are that never had to listen to these same old albums over and over again, but we, even, we have these songs that just continue to play over and over. You get tired of them, you get tired of them. And you may find yourself kind of in that position as you read through the book of Job. It's, what, 42 chapters? And it sounds like it's the same old thing. And you probably heard me up here saying kind of the same thing, right? And so here I am fishing for ways of telling you the same old story in different ways. And so I had to bring some visual aid this morning to help keep you awake because I know already some of you are yawning and about ready to drift off. So uh, I'm watching you, Mark. So... <laughs> We entered the second round of these three supposed friends of Job's. And they are already, we heard last week, it sounds like the same thing that, that we heard the last time the guy spoke. And what you're going to hear this morning is the same old song of the way that they unleash their venomous tongue onto this poor, suffering man, Job. And yet, the message is a bit different, but it's the same message. And as he comes to Job, Bildad is the guy that we're going to be looking at this morning, and I told you last week that I would show you this chart again, just to kind of refresh your memory. Bildad is going to be talking about the same thing, talking about his argument from the traditional standpoint. He's going to have the same type of theology, but yet... I think what really leads us into thinking this is the same old song is this baseline here, the formula. It's legalism. Because of things being this way in which they know, whether they're coming from tradition or experience or whatever, it all has that same tone of legalism throughout their conversation. And it causes us, as we read through this, to say, boy, these men have it all wrong. They have it all wrong with Job. But yet these men thought that they were certainly, absolutely correct in what they were thinking. And Job, the one, the victim, the very culprit of all of this, he knows for certain where he stands. And so we have this tension that continues to, to rub, each, rub each other the wrong way and as they're trying to endure this journey of life. Bildad, turn with me. <clears throat> to Job chapter 18, and we're going to look at the, actually the very last time that Bildad's going to speak, thankfully. <laughs> and he's going to be saying some nasty words to Job. Actually, some things that really shouldn't have been said. But here, here's what he says. Job chapter 1, and if you're using the chair Bibles, it's on page 428. Verses 1 through 4, and then Bildad to Shuhite answered and said, How long will you hunt for words? Consider, and then we will speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are, we, why are we stupid in your sight? You will tear yourself in your anger. Shall the earth be forsaken for you, or the rocks be removed out of its place? And I'm trying to imagine in my mind, 
him sitting there beside the, wherever Job is at. Maybe Job is in a chair. Maybe he's laying on the ground. Maybe he's in some type of, some type of bed. I don't know. But I'm imagining here this man is sitting in his chair because he's there for quite a while with Job. Sitting in his chair and listening. He just finished listening to his other friend talk. And, and, and he just gets done talking and Job responds and now it's Bildad. And I can imagine him just sitting back in his chair and based on verses 1-4 through four, thinking, you, Job, you really think the world revolves around you, don't you? You think because of all of this intense suffering that the world needs to stop and pay attention to what you're doing. And you may say that your life is like this, but we really know contrary to that <clears throat> it's different because we base it upon our argument. Maybe it's tradition. Maybe it's experience. And then he begins to unload on Job. He begins to, to show to him that, this, that Job is living a life that is apart from God. We know what you, we know what we thought we thought about you. We know we, we thought we thought about you. <laughs> but in reality, God knows the heart far greater and He's giving you what you deserve. And then he's going to be going off on this idea of death. Job brought the subject up, actually, at the end of chapter 17, the last time Job spoke. And so he's going to be picking up on this idea of death. And he's actually going to be talking to Job about death without God. And that would kind of presume that he's thinking that Job is going to die soon without God. And as he begins to talk, he's giving four analogies within his speech, talking about death without God. And it's really good theology. So don't think that he's wrong in what he's saying. It's just misapplied. And the very four things that he's going to be talking about, well, I'm going to be showing to you this morning. The very first thing will come in the idea of light. Light. Without God is light put out. Now, just to keep you awake, I brought some, some things. And this is where trustees get nervous when they see a candle and a, and a lighter and a pastor's hand. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, and that's exactly what is going to happen. So, trustees, just, just calm yourself. If you have to leave the room, I understand that too. Uh, but here it is. Here's the flame. <laughs> it worked. Good. <laughs> That was really the one I wanted to leave. No, <laughs> you deserve it, Dan. God is light. And we know from Scripture that to be the case. And, and not only is God light, uh, He also is life. And a lot of times when we look in Scripture about, uh, when it talks about light, it's referring to, there's synonymous terms, light and life. And God is light, and without Him there is no light at all. There is no life at all. He is the source of all life. Without Him there is no life at all. And I think probably most of you in this room would agree with that. And as we think of God, He is the life giver. There can be no life, whether you are in the world or or uh, one of the world that doesn't know God as their Savior, or maybe you are one that's one of His chosen children. But God gives life. And God is being described here by Bildad as the light. And God gives this light to people. And as we are born, there is life given to us. And we understand that to be true. But yet at the end of our life, the light is gone. The physical light, the life is gone out of our bodies. We know that to be true. And where does it go after then, after that? Well, it's very clear, the Bible is very clear, that those dying without the true light with inside of them, they will be cast into eternal lake of fire. And Jesus Himself describes that place as outer darkness, where there is no light at all, and there's actually a weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
And Bildad is describing Job as the light, the light that has gone out. That it's going to be gone out. It will be gone out physically. And he will be placed in outer darkness. So you need to have your life right with God. And you need to have that light, not just an external life, the physical light, but you need to have that internal life. And we know that, that those that, that truly know God as their Lord and Savior, the Messiah, in, in Job's case, the coming Messiah, he placed his faith in that coming Messiah. And inside of him there was a light that was burning, that was true. And when this physical life was over, that he continues to live with that light because he knew that he was of the Lord. That the Lord was the very existence of his life. And he pursued that light with all of his heart. But yet, for those that do not know the Lord as their Savior, when this life is over, it's like the light being put out. And they walk. In this life in darkness, in their minds, but also their existence outside of this life will be in eternal darkness. And he's telling Job, you need to make sure of where you stand at in your life. That your life is walking in accordance with God because it doesn't look like to us that it is. And God is judging you accordingly. And you need to get your life right because you don't want to die without God in your life. Otherwise, you will be like that candle that's put out in outer darkness. And that's the first analogy that he gives. You can breathe easy now. That's the first analogy that he gives. is a light being put out. And for those that are sinners without God, that's exactly what happens. The next analogy that he gives, whoop, there's hot wax and we'll land on the table, don't worry. It's like an animal being trapped. And wouldn't you know it, I just so happen to have a trap up here. Nobody stepped in it. This trap. There are different kinds of traps, and I've told you time before that uh, in my illustrious life, I've had the experience of, of trapping in a couple years growing up at home. And there are various forms of traps. And this trap that I brought today is a little bit safer. No one's going to get hurt with this one. I don't think any of you will fit in here. Maybe Micah might fit in there, huh? But anyway, a trap. You've got the basic concept of a trap, right? We, we, uh, you know, we, we set the trap and, and we put the bait there on the, let me hold it up for you. We put the bait there on that platform and we entice the, 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 the varmint to, to kind of meander in here. And once he, he starts eating off that, off that little flap deal there, the door comes down and we've got him. Boom! Got him. Once this door is down shut, there's no way that, tra- that animal's getting out. There's no way they're going to bust through that. They can even chew all they want, but they're not going to come out of it. They're not coming out. There's no way. And while I'll take this trap, and then as, as the trapee, I will, not trapees, but trapee, and I will take this animal wherever I want. And I will, I will take it out to the woods and let it free, so don't think that I'm going to do harm to it. That's a political thing to do. And so, uh, you're trapped. And so the premise of the trap is that it's ensnared, it's caught in there, and there's no way of escaping the trap. And that's exactly the way it is in life without God. That it traps you within that very realm, and you can't get out. Life without God is like a trap. And the natural man is entrapped by his own schemes. Whatever your bend is in life, the things that you pursue hard after, those are the things that ensnares you, that you go after. But in reality, no matter what you're pursuing besides God, is an entrapment of life, and it's going to seize you at some point. There's no escaping that. Bildad lists six different types of traps, but it only takes one to ensnare a person. So understand that life without God is like light put out in a trap. The very third, the, the third thing that he uses is the, uh, the analogy of a prisoner uh, being pursued. And right away I, I was rem- reminded of the two prisoners last year, I think it was last year, right, that escaped from the upstate New York prison. And I, I was fascinated by that. I, I don't know if you were too. 
I wasn't afraid that they were going to come down here, you know, and seek me out, of all people, and do something to me. I wasn't thinking about it. It was just fascinating, this whole pursuit. And, of course, you've seen pictures like this floating around where they cut a hole in a pipe and they got out of the prison. And, and it was like, wow, this day and age, people can get out of a, a prison like this. And, but yet they did it somehow, and they, they were free. And I was just imagining, for 22 days, they, they were on the, on the loose. And I can imagine these, these men, there, there was no peace for these men. They were, they were looking out over their shoulder probably every second of the day. And they would be maybe walking through the woods or running through the woods or whatever they did. And maybe they were sitting down resting and they would hear some leaves rustling. And What was that? Or a stick that was, that was being broken. And they would look around. And there was no rest for these men. And they, because they know they were being pursued by thousands of people. And they were looking for them, and they knew that they were being hunted down by all of these people. But like I said, after 22 days, it was all over. It was all over in $23 million at that. (laughs) But the idea is that these men, they ran, and they kept on going, they kept on going, and regardless of how hard they ran, they were going to get caught. It's the moral of the story. Now, I know that there are exceptions and people don't get caught, but with life without God, there is no escaping. You can run as hard as you can and you can try to divert everything, but one day you will be caught by death. Death will seize you. Death will come. And Bildad is relaying this to his friend Job. And he actually calls death the king of terrors. And that's exactly what it is for the man or woman without God. I praise the Lord that tomorrow we have a funeral that will be right here. And there was a man of God that will be laid here in a casket. And I know exactly, and the family knows, we have great, great peace that this man is not, is not surrounded by this king of terrors. He was set free years ago. And he is with his maker today. And I was just thinking as we were singing the songs of, with the angels, I'm thinking, Terry, that, that, that man, is, he loved music. He played organ and all that. And he is now in a choir like, un, like nothing else a man can. And here he is singing with the angels this morning. I, I, just can't, I just can't hardly comprehend that. But yet for the man or woman without God, you will meet the king of terrors, death itself. And he's pleading with his dear friend to make his heart, his life right to God. And then fourthly, he has another analogy, and it's of a tree being uprooted. Now I went to the, I went to the great lengths of uh, <laughs> going out beside the church here, and I pulled the, the biggest tree that I could out, and, and this is what I got. Yeah, I should have had... Maybe a teenager pull one out for me or something. But this is this is what we got. And I pulled this thing out, and I'm surprised I didn't pull my back out by doing this. But anyway, I went out there and I found a. a it, it was seemed like a healthy tree. I know this time of the year when there's no leaves on it, but but you look at if you were this close to it, you would see some buds that are that are promising some spring life to this tree. And if you take your fingernail and scratch the bark, you'd see some green underneath there. So it, it really looked like here was a tree that was full of life. And so life without God it can be like this. It, it can look like a full and healthy tree. And it can be full of life. And, you know, you could climb on it. And you can hang a rope swing from it and, and do all kinds of things. But one day that that tree will be uprooted. And then we will really see where the roots are, what the roots are. And for the one without God living his life or her life is like you'll see the roots where they're already rotting and decaying. The, their life, it appears to be life, but in reality, already in this life, the roots are decaying and rotting. And one day that tree will be uprooted and you will clearly see where their life really was heading. And for this tree that really had no life to it, it will eventually be cut up and perhaps used as firewood or, or some other things that, are, that, that we do with, with broke, pushed down trees. 
But we can easily see that that trees that are uprooted, especially in residential areas, they will be taken away and the hole will be filled in and years to come you won't even know they exist. But yet, for the man or woman who dies without God, we may forget as mankind, but in reality God will never forget and He will hold you accountable. Is your life like a tree that's being pushed over or not? Where you can clearly see what the roots are. And so here Bildad is given these analogies to his friend Job because he doesn't want his friend to die, to live or to die without God. And it's good theology. It's very sound theology. And he's absolutely correct. But the problem was it's misapplied theology. That's really not where his heart was at, Job's heart was at. To summarize what he said here, according to this theologian, it is the divine law that suffering that sufferings are the punishment of sin. And you can no more alter this than at your command, or for your sake, the earth, which was made for man to inhabit, be made desolate. There's no way you can avoid any of these things. This is the way it's going to happen. And he's pleading with Job to get his life right. But moving on into this last chapter we're going to look at this morning is Job chapter 19. We're going to see where Job masterfully takes these objects and he will begin showing Bildad that his life is not towards death. Death without God. But it's life. He's taking these objects and the things that are being known to these friends of his looking like their payment for the life that he lived without God and the punishment. And he's taking these objects and he's showing them that his suffering was not about death, but about life. (laughs) This is life. We have pressures of life and we run hard. We have the sufferings of this life. And every one of you in this room has been dealing with suffering at one point or another in your life. And maybe you're here today dealing with suffering. And this is a picture of life. This is a matter of of the way things are here on earth. But Job is telling him that his life is not portraying death, but it's going to be a picture of life itself. He then talks about this idea of, of the trap and the light and all of these objects. And he's saying, yeah, you know what? Life is closing around me just like this trap. And one day, death, physical death, will come to my body. Yes, it will close me in just like this. But it's not to eternal death. It's not to the lake of fire. It's not hemming me in like this. And I'm not surrounded by this. But my death, when it happens, I will no longer be on this earth. Just like you and me. Just like my father-in-law. He's no longer on this earth. But he stands before God himself because of the Messiah. Because of his faith in Christ. And life is going to squeeze us in and eventually take this mortal life that you and I live. It will hem in around us. But the suffering is not to death, but it's to life. It has eternal value that's going on in my life. And you need to understand that, Bill Dad. Yeah, you know what? I have trouble in my life. And I cry for help. You've heard me cry out to heaven for some kind of help, for some kind of explanation. But I find it, but yet I still have these problems in my life. I understand that. And it looks like it's punishment for sin, but there is an eternal value that I continue to endure the journey. Even the friends and the family around Job, he felt like friends and family was abandoning him. That they would avoid him. They didn't want to be around him because of his apparent wicked ways, his sinfulness that was predominating his life, presuming to dominate his life. And yet the suffering continued to go on. But then as he comes down into this chapter, I want to show you something that is so wonderful. And I hope you underline it in your own Bible. He gives a declaration for life. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the greatest declarations for life found throughout Scripture. And as we look at these verses, and actually it's only 25 to 26, it's not 27. And let me read to you these incredible verses. For I know that my Redeemer lives. 
and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet my flesh, in my flesh, I will see God. Did you hear what he said? I know that my Redeemer lives. He is telling us, he is telling us clearly that his faith is in the Redeemer, capital R. That is where he has placed his faith, his trust, 100% and nothing less. And he knows when this physical body is all dried up, whenever it's decayed and goes back into the ground, it's not the end of it. He will stand before His Redeemer, that coming Messiah He was anticipating, which we know today as Jesus Christ Himself. He knows that because of Him and the faith that He has in Him, that one day He will stand before God, be stand before His Redeemer because He knows He lives. He knows that that is the one that paid the price of His sin, regardless of this life situation, regardless of the bearing down upon His life. He knows that He will stand before God and He rests in that hope. And I am so, so thankful for these verses. And I've underlined them in my Bibles, and please do the same. And maybe you want to put it on your screensaver this week, or post it on your refrigerator but is of great hope. And what's fascinating is you go through Scripture and you see men and women of God that has also been squeezed by life itself, been going through this world that is not friendly to a believer. And yet they take a stand and they make a declaration of faith and we have it recorded in Scripture. I don't know if you've ever seen them before, but I'm going to point them out to you. There are countless of passages in in Scripture by these great heroes. And be careful, I'm going to flip the screen on you because there's more. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. If you really want them, I can email them to you or I can do something. But here's another list, here's a second list, of people that make great declarations of faith. And it's so, it's so encouraging to see these people that have endured life far worse than what we live in. Suffering. And maybe we will one day, as this country continues to spiral downward morally, maybe one day we'll enter into a suffering like these men and women have done. And God only help us that we would become strong in our faith, and that we would be able to endure, be able to endure not only the suffering that we face today, but the futuristic suffering that could be on the horizon. And yet, we find these men and women decked giving a strong declaration of their faith. This morning, I'd just like to draw a a simple application. It's really, it's really, it really comes down to one thing that I want you to understand. Suffering. There is a great benefit, benefits to suffering. And I know when you're in the midst of suffering, there is no benefit, right? Right? All you want it to do is get over and get rid of the pain and get rid of these things, but yet God allows this suffering to enter into our life because it does provide benefits to us. And this morning I want to show you another benefit. This morning I want to show to you the benefit of suffering. Another benefit is that it clarifies our perspective. And I'm going to give you two sub-points under this to help you understand, and even the sub-points I'll have to explain to you in a little bit because you may not understand what I wrote. But it clarifies our perspective. And number one, the, the one sub-point is it causes us to question conventional wisdom. We've had some pretty masterful teachers on uh, uh, experience and tradition and all of those things. We, those three friends of his, they're master teachers at, at, at history and all of those things. And even thought theology, some aspects of theology. And they're great teachers. But it, it should cause us to question that conventional wisdom. They believed that Job was enduring the suffering because of something that he did or did not do. That's conventional wisdom. We judge people more than what we really let on to. We say, well, we're not judged. You know, and we say that, but we say it tongue-in-cheek because we really sometimes do judge people. We look at people and, and we see what they're going through and we, and we say the same things. They're getting exactly what they deserve. 
you didn't pay your bills the last three years, of course they're going to take your car. <laughs> of course they're going to kick you out on the street. Of course they're going to shut down your credit. And we sit there and say, see, you know, and we don't really know sometimes. We really don't know what's going on. And yet we stand there and we, and we kind of think in our minds, they're getting what they deserve. It's conventional wisdom. Or, or there's a ton of other examples that I could give you in that way. But we need to be very careful at that, at sharing that conventional wisdom. And when we are enduring the suffering and people are looking at us and maybe sharing with us those things that Job's friends were, and they're accusing us, and they're bearing down on us and creating more suffering... We need to understand, we need to really have the focus like Job did. And say, listen, I don't buy into that. That's not the case with me because I know, I know my Redeemer lives and I know where my heart is and I know I stand correct before God and I've been living after Him and following Him and that conventional wisdom that you're pushing down my throat doesn't stand here. And so suffering really helps to clarify where Job's heart is at in the matter. He knows that his Redeemer lives. And so it really helps to clarify that in his, uh, in his journey. And secondly, it's, it's come somewhat similar. It causes us to remove all obstacles that may prevent us from clearly understanding where our hearts truly lie. Remember Job chapter 1, and this is what I mean by that. Job chapter 1 we pick up on the event of Job's life. The guy was amazing. And we look and we think, man, I want to be like Job 1. (laughs) That's it. End of story. I don't want to be anything more than than Job chapter 1. I want to be that prosperous man or woman. I want to be the greatest man or woman of the East. I want want people to gather around me because I can impart uh, great wisdom. I want to be good in my business dealings. I want to be honest with people. I want to walk that straight and narrow life. I want to have that relationship with the Lord. I want to be just like Job chapter (laughs) 1. And I wonder, in the course of Job's life, I just wonder, in the back of Job's mind, he knows, he knows that God prospered him. He knows that God did all of this stuff for him. And he, he did all this. But I wonder in the back of his mind if he says, listen, Job, he's talking to himself. Job, do you really, really, really obey the Lord? Are you really in love with God? Do you, do you, are you more vested in Him, totally invested in Him, more than anything else? Because he spends so much time with all of this stuff that God has given to him and his pursuits and apprehending those things. Do you really love, do I really love God more than these things? It might cause a person to question. And I hope that that question has run through your mind. You may not have all of what Job did, Job chapter 1. But you have stuff. You have family, you have friends, you have belongings, you have things that you enjoy in life. Have you thought, and don't shake your head or anything, you don't have to do any of that stuff, but have you thought in the back of your mind, if it all was gone, would I still serve the Lord? Would I still pursue God? Would I still make the declaration that I know my Redeemer lives, and I know that I need to stay faithful and committed and following what I'm supposed to be doing? Have you thought about that? If it's all stripped away, would I still be a follower of Christ? Suffering causes us to remove the pursuits of all of these things. Think about it. If you were suffering, if you had this uh, terminal illness, let's say, and you were enduring the pain and suffering, maybe cancer is crowding in on you and, and, and really just dominating your life and the things that you do, and it really pushes all of those things out of the way. They're not as important as they used to be. And I really focus, where is my heart truly lying? Where is it at? Suffering will do that. And it causes me to think about you folks. And it causes me to ask this question that I must ask you on a day like this. Do you know who your Redeemer is? And if you were to take a survey out in the world today, you would have some interesting answers, no doubt. And you may have 
answers of who they think their Redeemer is and how they know that and this sort of thing. And then it may lead into a conversation, do you know that if you were to die today, if you would, if you would go to heaven or not? One of those types of questions. And, the, and a lot of times you get the answer that, oh, well, I, well, I think I've done a lot of good things. I, I, haven't, I haven't killed anyone or I haven't sliced anybody's tires, well, this week. Or I haven't uh, robbed a bank, or, you know, I, I haven't um, cursed at anybody today. Or I haven't, uh, you know, I, I lived a pretty decent life. I, I'm not the Adolf Hitler. I'm, I'm not somebody that goes out and goes ballistic with her car and making a missile out of it. I don't do anything like that. So I think I've been a pretty decent person. So I think if I stand before God, I think that he'll see that I'm in the upper percentile of good people. And I think that I have a pretty good chance of getting in. <laughs> Who do you think that they just said their Redeemer is? Themselves. They really do think that they're their own Redeemer. They may not come out and say it, but that's exactly what they just said. I'm my own Redeemer. I'm the one that can set me free. I'm the one that can pay the penalty to all my sin. And I know that God, I can stand right before God because of me. (laughs) Don't be deceived. Don't allow yourself to be involved in that lie. There is only one Redeemer that has ever lived, and that's Jesus. And the ancients knew that that one day He would be coming. They looked forward to a coming Messiah as Job did. And they placed their faith that God would redeem me through the coming Messiah. And one day He was born, in which we celebrate this time of the year. A Savior was born in the city of Bethlehem. And we celebrate that. That is worth celebrating. That is worth putting the lights out and and bringing out all the decorations and saying, Woo! The Redeemer's come! We've been waiting all of mankind for the Redeemer to come. And here He is! Praise the Lord! Joy to the world! All of those wonderful things. We celebrate that. Rightfully so. And there has never been another Redeemer. There doesn't need to be another Redeemer. And He has paid the price for our sin. He has paid the price for your sin. But you must have faith in Him as Job did. You need to place, surrender your life and place your faith in Him. Otherwise, you stand before God on your own merit. You will face God as you do these, this trap where eventually it will take you and capture you. Or this light that's gone out and you'll be cast in outer darkness. I'm not trying to scare you folks. This is the Word of God. And you need to have the Redeemer. You need to place your faith in Him and Him alone. And so I beg you today, if you don't know Him as your Redeemer, as your Savior and Lord, you can do that today. And please, 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 don't let another day go by because you may not have tomorrow. Talk to me, talk to one of our leaders, and we would be glad to sit down because I'm sure you have questions. And maybe sometime this week, the hound dog of heaven, the Holy Spirit, I think Tozer named the Holy Spirit that, the hound dog of heaven, bringing conviction on your life and saying, hey, listen, bub, you have never placed your faith in Christ. You need a Redeemer. You need Jesus Christ in your life. And this week, as the hound dog of heaven pulls at your heart, pulls and pulls and pulls, you need to respond to that. I'm a, my, my name and number is in the bulletin, email, whatever. We'll sit down, we'll have coffee, whatever. And, and I'd be glad to share with you from Scripture any, anything that it could help you to understand. You need to place your faith in Christ. Now, you may be here today. You may be here today. And you say, you know what? I have placed my faith in Christ. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. And I am so thankful that through the suffering that God has allowed, that it has really clarified where my heart truly lies. I am so thankful for that. I'm thankful that God has been merciful in that way. Even though it's difficult, it's tough, it really helps to know where my heart lies. And I'm thankful, God, that you have allowed me to know that for certain in my suffering. So thank you. Thank you for that. But folks, if you're not here without the Lord, you need to understand Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is no salvation. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. Understand that. Trust Him. 
as your Redeemer and Savior as Job. I'm going to close in a word of prayer, and then Terry's going to come up and lead us in a closing song. Heavenly Father, we want to again just thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the peace that we can have in Christ. And God, I pray that this morning, if there's someone here that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day. Today would be the day that would change everything for their life. That they can know for certain that you are the Redeemer. And today they need to make you their Redeemer. And may they respond to that today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.